arguing for higher salaries and doing so consciously, but also recognizing that your starting salary does typically dictate more or less your career salary trajectory. Welcome to the Veterinary Financial Podcast, where we discuss financial freedom and whole life success. I'm Meredith Jones, an emergency vet in Virginia. And I'm Willie Bidot, a lab animal specialist in California. Our guest today is Andrew Rotz. He is a certified financial planner and the director of personal finance and financial literacy at North Carolina State's College of Veterinary Medicine. So Andrew, what does your day-to-day look like working at NC State and what sort of groups do you work with? Great question. So my role predominantly is working one-on-one with students in my office or via Zoom to work through their personal financial situations, provide counseling and coaching and actual fiduciary advice as it pertains to their situations. I'm also scattered in throughout the DVM curriculum, whether that be orientation or first or second year classes, or also during our fourth year clinical conference. So I teach two specific topics with the ultimate goal of trying to drive the student into those one-on-one counseling sessions, since that is where the largest impact can be made. And, you know, we're sharing personal financial information, which is is confidential. And clearly, you know, we don't want to necessarily do that in a large group setting like a classroom. So predominantly working with the DVMs. However, my services are very much open to our house officers, our interns and residents, as well as our offshore students that come to us for their fourth year clinical rotation. And I'm also available to our students up to a year after they depart the CVM, which is a big value add since, you know, they, they don't necessarily have a lot of opportunity to explore the things that we learn about in the curricular setting until they actually get to the workplace and they see their W-2 and they see their W-4 and understand what 401k withholdings, you know, forms and documentation look like. So it's a, it's a good opportunity to kind of give them a baseline foundation knowledge and then actually be able to walk through the, the process with them as they get to the real world and are navigating these actual topics that we've discussed. Awesome. And so you mentioned groups and individuals. So Mm -hmm. how do you work with students overall? Yeah, so I also make sure that I'm scattered throughout the curriculum via curricular committees, hiring committees. I'm the club sponsor for one of our business clubs. Trying to, again, just emphasize the importance of personal finance and, and generally life skills throughout their learning experience. I work with the practice management professor and the career services director to deliver some of this content that really, these lanes are blurry, right? And so what might be practice finance very much becomes personal finance very quickly as a practice owner, for example. And then you're hiring people, so you need to understand interviewing skills and resume writing. So we work very closely together, the three of us, to provide a concise level of education and information to the student body. So it seems like you have a team up in NC State. Yeah, we've got a really good team of professionals, some of whom have not been in the veterinary community until they got to this role, some who have spent decades in the veterinary community. So it's nice to have a blend because the veterinary industry is very unique and in many ways they are cutting edge and in many ways they are behind the times. And so it's a nice blend of, hey, well, this is what works in this industry. Can it work over here? Yes, it can. So let's explore and dig into how that can work oh, this is how things have been done in the veterinary community for 20 or 30 years. It's tried and true. Great. You know, how can we use that in other industries to make sure we're providing the best level of service possible to the students? That's what they're paying for, whether they realize it or not with their tuition. That's what they're paying for is is to get the most out of us as possible. So we try to deliver that efficiently and in an enlightened way as much as possible. That's awesome. Yeah, there's a couple of cool things that you said. One is that you've got folks you work with who are from other industries and bringing in thoughts and ideas from what they had learned outside of the veterinary industry. And then the other thing is the fact that the students can, after they graduate, they can continue to work with you for a year after they graduate, which is amazing. That's awesome that NC State sees the value of doing that. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, when you look at the statistics, the number of veterinarians who change jobs within a year or two of leaving the CVM, you're doing them a disservice by not providing those resources throughout their education. But again, recognizing that a lot of this is not applicable necessarily until they get to the real world. 
and have the opportunity to stretch those muscles and see what really works for them. Because, you know, how many veterinarians do you know that were dead set on becoming a surgeon until their fourth year and then they fell in love with zoo med or something like that, right? That's just a random example. Or maybe they were equine focused and then they saw the money situation. They're like, no, I'd rather earn a little bit higher paycheck and have a little bit more comfortable lifestyle, for example, or live in a, a more urban setting than rural. Maybe they get married and that changes their circumstances and their desires. So it's important to try to be as adaptable as possible as people's wants and needs change. Mm -hmm. I love that yeah. because, you know, I became a specialist, but I made that decision when I was trying to apply for uh, internships or residencies and I was deciding what should I specialize on? So fourth year, well, like four or five months into fourth year. And that's when I actually made that decision. Yeah. yeah. Some people, they wait until the end of the fourth quarter to throw the game winning touchdown. Right. And that's okay. You know, everybody does things differently. Yeah. And so you said that you work with interns and residents. What are their biggest financial concerns? Far and away, the biggest concern in the veterinary community is student loans. With roughly 18 to 20 percent of each graduating class graduating with no loans, that's still 80 plus percent of each class that has loans in some way, shape or form. Most of those are federal student loans, but there's plenty that are private. There's, you know, grad plus some people have loans from undergrad as well as grad school. Maybe they did a master's in between, you know, their undergrad. Either way, the point being, student loans are prevalent in the community. It's obviously top of mind. It leads to a lot of the other issues in the mental health space in the community. So uh, there's a lot of publicity about it, which is good. It's good to bring awareness. What I try to do is, is make sure that I'm validating those concerns, but also try not to focus exclusively on those concerns because the student loans are just one piece of the overall puzzle. If we're going to be financially well, if we're going to preach financial wellness, we need to also be focusing on you know risk, making sure we have the appropriate insurances in place to protect you and your, your loved ones. Uh, we need to make sure we've got an emergency fund. We're handling other aspects of consumer debt appropriately. We're taking care of not just you now, but you 30 years from now, your kids 15 years from now. It really is a, a, an all hands on deck trying to make sure we understand everything that's going on and so that we're not ignoring the forest for the trees. But yeah, that is the predominant issue is student loans. So great, let's tackle it. Let's educate around it. Let's help people get a plan. But we're not going to necessarily always go with one solution which is more of like the Dave Ramsey, we're going to pay it down as quickly as possible, when doing so actually limits the ability to save for retirement or buy a house, which probably isn't the best idea right now with the current housing market. Here we are in, in June of 2022. But recognizing that there are other financial priorities that we can't ignore just because of student loans. And you know that's where we have to educate around time value of money, compound interest, and why making certain decisions today versus waiting three or four or five years can make a big difference in the overall outcomes. Do you see any positive as to the students that have student loans or, or house officers? They come to your office with that concern, but that's the first time you can probably bring up the financial plan and actually discuss that with them. Yeah, absolutely. So not every school has a personal financial educational program. I get that. And I think we'll talk a little bit about that later in this podcast. For many of our house officers, we've got roughly 80 to 100 each year. Many of them, I'm their first exposure to formal personal finance education and coaching. And so first of all, trying to illustrate the value that my community can bring. Although my community is not 100% where I want them to be when it comes to coaching veterinarians, dentists, f physical therapists, folks in that, they all kind of have the same demographic of high debt, lower income relative to human doctors kind of thing. So I have some work on my own industry to do. You know, we're working on through the small group of us that kind of do this as a living. But yeah, so working with them, giving them as much confidence as possible that they can do the right things, that they have the tools in their tool belt, whether it be already or me giving those tools to them while they're here, that they can feel confident going forward that they're going to do the right things for their long-term success. And what are some of the common financial mistakes you see vet students and early career vets making? Great question. I preach and I say it that way because it sometimes comes across like this is a devout belief of mine that the budget is the foundation of all of your financial decisions. And the number of people that do not have a formally constructed budget is 
mind boggling to me because if you haven't written down your budget in some way, shape or form, I don't care if it's on a napkin or, you know, in YNAB, the app or an Excel spreadsheet or what have you, I don't really care. It's the process of going through your expenses and identifying how you spend your money and identifying if how you spend your money aligns with your values and making sure that you're accomplishing everything that you're trying to accomplish in the reasonable time frames that you're looking to do so. If you haven't gone through that process, then you're letting your budget dictate what you are able to accomplish instead of you dictating to your budget what you're able to accomplish. I find that once I convey it in that way of like you're letting your money control you, Instead of you actively taking steps to control yourself and your future, often the type A personalities predominantly in the veterinary space are like, whoa, whoa, whoa. You mean I'm not controlling this? I like to control things, right? And so it's like, okay, cool. Now I've identified what will motivate you. So let's take that and and run with it to make sure that we get the right things done. So that is the primary issue that I come across is People don't have a budget. They haven't spent the time to evaluate what their income looks like and identify if how they spend their money aligns with what they're actually trying to accomplish. I like that. So you're kind of using that type A personality and say, oh, you know, you don't have control of this. Absolutely. That's called (laughs) behavioral finance right there. There you go. (laughs) So student debt, of course, is one of the most common concerns. And so what are the most common questions you get from students about student debt? So the most common is, well, how do I know which repayment plan is right for me? And on the surface, it's a very honest and appropriate question. I'm hoping (laughs) if they're one of my students as a DVM uh, and they're asking this, they've at least paid attention to some of the classes and have identified at least the difference between like a standard repayment plan and an income-driven repayment plan. Maybe, hopefully, they also have some contextual knowledge of public service loan forgiveness. Generally, the questions are, how do I know what's appropriate for me? As my life changes, does my loan repayment strategy need to change with it? And the answer to that is yes, probably. And my goal for our students is twofold. At graduation, I would hope and want them to have a fully funded emergency fund as a bare minimum and have tried to reduce their total loan balance by as much as possible, whether that be scholarships, part-time work, family help, thoughtful, conscientious budgeting, and cost control measures. And the idea behind those two things is that, first of all, an emergency isn't going to derail their ability to manage their finances thoughtfully. And then with the student loan situation, trying to give them as many options as possible. Some folks with higher loan balances, there's only one viable option with their loan repayment strategy, and that is income-driven repayment plan for 20 or 25 years. I would hope that through thoughtful spending and reduction in the amount of loans that they might end up taking, we're able to put them in a position where if they are able to negotiate higher salary within five years of graduating and they're you know, small and MLGP or something like that, maybe they become an owner eventually, those things would actually potentially adjust their repayment strategy. Is that common? Not really. Not with the way tuition rates are right now. But the way I have seen veterinary incomes increase over the past handful of years, I'm hoping that in the short term, we will be able to have some of those conversations of, hey, maybe you have a couple lean years with a standard repayment strategy, but then because you're earning so much and you have so much in you know, ProSal, for example, you're able to comfortably accommodate that standard 10-year repayment, and now your loans are gone in in eight years instead of 10. You reduce the impact of interest on your loans, and you didn't have to do the 20-year repayment program with the income-driven repayment. Right now, it's not the case, but I'm hoping in the near future, we'll get there. Yeah, with compensation trending the way it has the last couple of years. And then, of course, the other thing that I don't hear a lot of people talking about this, but interest hasn't accumulated the last couple of years because of the COVID interest freeze. And so while they were in school, it used to be that 20000 or up to 50000 in interest was accumulating while they were in school. It hasn't done that the last couple of years, which is pretty interesting. And so you're seeing some of the loan balances are going to actually be lower as a result. Yes, for sure. And there's additional layers there. You know, with a standard loan repayment, it was a stretch for them to pay off their interest before it capitalized into their principal. Well, with Mm -hmm. only a handful of thousands of dollars in interest that has accumulated for a lot of our graduating class, it's now a much more reasonable thing to accomplish to pay down $5,000 in debt in the next six months. 
Mm-hmm. You know, two years ago, that interest bucket was twenty, thirty thousand dollars, and that's a lot harder to accomplish unless you've been planning for that kind of thing. So yeah, we're we're seeing an interesting mm-hmm. dynamic as a result of the administrative forbearance, and that's why you know I always say like personal finance is a moving target, right? Whether it's your situation that changes, or legislation changes, or there's a global pandemic, or whatever, there's always something to plan around, which is nice because it keeps my job relevant. <laughs> There you go. It's good for job security. <laughs> yeah, your job is very relevant. That said, you know, talking to a financial planner, you mentioned two things that I want to ask. What do they mean to you? So one of them is emergency fund. What does an emergency fund mean? Yeah, on the, on the surface, the emergency fund means it's protecting yourself against unexpected things that occur. And that could be a pet getting sick, a car breaking down you know, an unexpected expense, like a flight that you need to take to go help out a sick parent, whatever it is, right? That emergency is is really self-defined, but you're in a position where you're able to comfortably take care of that without going into debt to do so by putting it on a credit card, for example. What that should look like is roughly, per CFP standards, three to six months worth of your essential expenses. Now, how do you know what your essential expenses are? You've done your budget that dictates what your essential and non-essential expenses are. Therefore, like I said, the budget is the linchpin for all of your financial decisions. So that's what an emergency fund means to me, and that's what it should look like and how to come about with that number. Awesome. We don't tend to like the word budget, but uh, I'll let it be for this podcast. <laughs> Spending um, plan. The cash flow plan. Spending plan. <laughs> <laughs> um, So now that you mentioned the budget, and you mentioned a few applications that you can use to create one, but you know, you do consult with quite a few students, what's your usual go to an Excel sheet, Mint, which is free, YNAB is amazing. So yeah. Yeah, um, I mean, to each their own, right? I prefer a smart Excel with some macros that can do a bunch of stuff for me, I can graph things as I want. That obviously takes a little bit of either Googling or, you know, formal knowledge to attain the ability to do that. But again, I've met with people who have built their budgets on a PDF and they just wrote it down. Some use Mint. To me, it's not about the form that it takes. It's about the function and actually going through the exercise of thinking critically about how you spend your money and aligning how you spend with what you want to accomplish. And I will meet the individual where they're at. If they want to use a certain technology, great, let's do it. If they want to be a caveman and bring in their budget on a napkin, I'm fine with that too. I will work with them how they want to be worked with as long as we're accomplishing what their stated and their implied goals are. Awesome. So we're seeing more and more veterinarians meeting with student loan consultants to help them figure out their repayment strategy. And certainly that's something that you do as part of your role with NC State as well. And so when do you think is the ideal time to pursue a student loan consult? Great question. First and foremost, right, my industry is not, and by my industry, I mean the financial services industry, they are not as a whole on board with the student loan repayment conversations. It's Mm -hmm. not profitable for the most part. And so what we've found in the last handful of years, decade, is that there are a few key players that have carved out the niche in the student loan planning space, which is great. It's a need. It absolutely is a need, and it is going to cost people money, but that's okay, right? Nice things cost money, right? Especially when they can save you tens, if not hundreds of thousands of dollars Mm -hmm. for the tune of a couple hundred dollars up front. So the appropriate time, in my opinion, to meet with somebody to develop an actual plan is once we know the numbers of the situation. Now, for most folks, that's not until their fourth year when they actually have at least one, maybe two job offers in hand that they're deciding between. The reason for that is not only do we need to wait for you to understand what your actual total loan balance is going to be, which again is towards the end of your educational career, but then we also need to understand what your income situation is going to look like. What do your expenses look like based on the fringe benefits that you're going to be offered? We really need to look at the whole equation to appropriately recommend this is the right plan for you for now. Like I said, as their situation changes, it might dictate a change in the repayment strategy. In many cases, it won't, but we do need to leave that door open in case it does. Again, inheritance might occur, sale of a business might occur, they might invent something that they're able to then, you know, make a a massive amount of money off of, right? Those types of things will probably dictate a change in their repayment strategy. So we have to leave that door open. But really to build the plan, we need all of the information available. Can we educate around those plans beforehand? Yes, absolutely. 
That's why introducing folks to income-driven repayment plans, standard loan repayment, graduated loan repayment, it's important to be able to introduce those topics. But really, in terms of relevance, most students I found aren't going to pay attention until the decision is right in front of them. Yeah, that makes sense. That makes a lot of sense. And I can talk about student loans for a long time, but <laughs> we recently did an episode on that. So for anyone listening, you can go back to our May episode where we discuss student loans pretty extensively. So that said, I want to jump into something that I'm very excited to talk about, which is jobs and contracts. So what new trends are you seeing with veterinary job offers and contracts? Yeah, so a couple key things there. We alluded to it earlier, but we have seen increases in compensation over the last five to 10 years, which is good. That should naturally occur, right? As inflation occurs, wage growth should also increase so it doesn't stagnate. But what we're seeing, particularly with small animal GP, maybe emergency veterinarian space, certain sections of the industry are growing far outpacing inflation, which is phenomenal. If you look at the trajectory of incomes from pre-2008 financial crisis, for the past decade, actually we're close to 15 years now since the Great Recession, wages have not caught up with that trajectory. I think mm -hmm. in the last year or two, we're probably sniffing that trend line finally, which is great, which means that we are finally catching up to where we should have been based on that trajectory. Now, that being said, it doesn't mean the entire industry is doing that. There are absolutely some sectors of the industry that are, that are being left behind, to be frank. I attribute a lot of that growth to corporate medicine and the impact that that is having on employment contracts. It's not necessarily a bad thing. I'm not here to, to trash talk a Banfield or BCA or a Blue Pearl or, or any of these more corporate entities. I think what they're doing is providing benefits that associates need and want. And to be frank, it's been far too long in the industry that these things haven't really existed or been prevalent. The disadvantage to that happening is that the small mom and pop privately owned practices and clinics don't have the capacity to be able to offer all of those fringe benefits. So they need to be selective about which ones really matter and try to really squeeze out the best bang for the buck. And that's where working with someone like me or a career services individual at one of the universities who sees the data and speaks one-on-one -on -one with the students about what is important to them can really add a lot of value to the practice. And that, that has absolutely happened. I work with a lot of practices, specifically in North Carolina, who are saying, well, why, why am I not winning employees? Why am I not winning the bidding battle? I'm offering the same salary. It's like, okay, great, but are you offering group health care? Are you offering to pay for their liability or their disability or their license defense insurance? Are your CE allowances up to par? Are you giving them the appropriate PTO? Right? So it's more than just the salary to truly, again, focus on that word of financial wellness. You really need to be looking at more than just what is that signing bonus? What is the salary? The other trend that I'm seeing is a lot more chatter in a good way about getting rid of non-competes. I love the idea of getting rid of non-competes. I've been pretty vocal on LinkedIn about this, as well as a couple other folks. But if you are treating your employees correctly, if you're compensating them well, if you are developing them and appreciating them, you don't need a non-compete. They will stay with you. And it bugs me that employers feel like they need a non-compete when in reality, it's just treating people the right way is going to accomplish the same thing with a much more positive connotation than if you leave us, these are the repercussions. And that's really what a non-compete is. Mm -hmm. And it's frustrating because it's completely unnecessary in today's day and age. Yeah, non-competes are a subject we can definitely talk about for a full episode. But I live in California where apparently non-competes, you can't have them really in the contract or you can't go to court with them. Yeah. So that's also interesting that some states have those laws. So what do fourth-year students and new grads need to keep in mind as they are receiving their first job offer? That's a great question. I think on the surface, the answer is it's not going to be your last job offer. And we can read into that as you want. But on the surface, right, <laughs> let's say you're a fourth year right now. In which many cases, a lot of our third years are locking in jobs, right, during their third year before they ever get to clinics because employers recognize the value of investing in these folks and they're able to provide a compensation model that actually pays them in their fourth year to offset their student loans, right? And yes, it's taxable income, but it's a different way of thinking about things. And I appreciate people trying to solve problems a little bit differently than the norm. 
But yeah, so whether it be you get multiple job offers before you ever graduate or right after graduation, or by saying it's not going to be your last job offer, recognizing that this first job is not going to be your last job, right? There's no such thing as a perfect job. And that's why we alluded to earlier, again, average of roughly a year and a half is the tenure of new associate DVMs. They stay in their first job for a year to two, which means if you're putting so much emphasis on this is going to be the best mentorship possible, or this is going to be the best compensation, or they've got all the toys and the gadgets, it's a beautiful building, like cool, but you're probably not going to be there more than two years. So let's not put too much emphasis on things that aren't necessarily super important to you. Let's focus on what you need to do to make yourself happy and make sure that you're taking care of yourself and not burning bridges with these other employers because networking makes the world go round. Meeting people and making good impressions is going to get you far further in life than, you know, being the smartest person in the room. So your first job offer won't be your last. That means a lot of different things. Network, don't burn bridges. Understand that you have leverage as a new DVM or a soon-to-graduate DVM. You have so much leverage. There are so many more job openings than there are DVMs to fill them. So use that leverage. Negotiate higher salaries, more PTO, better maternity care or parental leave. Use those tools to negotiate for your own behalf. And guess what? You're also helping those that come behind you because far too frequently have we seen practices that go years without being able to hire a new associate DVM because they don't update their policies and procedures. They don't update their compensation. They're still using job contracts from five years ago when so much has changed. Mm -hmm. We in the industry have to change the industry. No one's going to do it for us. And so that's where I'd say use your leverage. The best way to understand what leverage you have is through networking, understanding what your peers are doing, understanding what the associate DVM that graduated two years before you experienced and how you can, you know, repeat their successes and try to avoid their mistakes. Yeah, that's really great advice. So, Andrew, what tips do you have for comparing job offers? Great question. There's always going to be an emotional component to making decisions. The best we can try to do is take as much emotion out of the decision as possible until the very last moment, right? Or I should say at the very beginning, if you know something's not the right choice, then just disregard it, right? Don't keep it around just because the numbers make you really happy. If you don't like the boss, if you don't like the location, and there's an emotional cringe that occurs when you think about it. Cool. Got it. Don't pursue it any further. Let it go. That's okay. Let the employer down in an appropriate and responsible way. You're not going to burn the bridge. They're going to actually respect you for saying, this isn't the right opportunity for me. I appreciate your interest in me. Good luck moving forward with your search. But let's just say that emotional hurdle has been overcome. And now you've got two or three options that are very viable. And now you're torn as to which way to go. That's where we try to introduce as much quantitative information as possible. So I ask for my students to develop some sort of quantitative measure for what is important to them. Is it location? Is it type of building? Is it type of employer, corporate versus private, public, what have you? What does the compensation look like? What does PTO look like? and try to rank those in terms of priorities to them. Then we actually try to quantify each of those things. So obviously salary, that's a number. We try to estimate what production component might look like. We can, based on salary, quantify what each day of PTO is worth. We can quantify what disability policies and health insurance premiums, all those things we can quantify. And I throw them up. I have a nice big board in my office. I throw them all up on the board. And we start to just rack and stack all these numbers and say, okay, well, based on these three employers and the numbers of all this quantification we've done, this one wins in these four categories, this other one wins in these six categories, this one wins in this one category. And based on how you prioritized your wants and needs, you can see which company wins. And then you got to make sure that it complies with your emotions. Is that the one that you wanted to win? (laughs) Because sometimes that's not the case. You're like, oh, I really liked this other practice. But liking one doesn't necessarily mean it's the right option. Again, you're going to stay at this company for probably a year and a half to two years. Let's not forfeit all of these other benefits that can set you up for financial success. Recognizing that you can go to that other employer in two years if you really wanted to, right? Nothing's set in stone. Yeah, we we have a blog that's called compensation. It's not just about salary. And, you know, we put dollar signs to those different benefits. I guess I really like the concept of also ranking them. 
that is yeah. very important for your wellness. So yeah. I, I like that. Yeah, and there, there's situations where someone will take less compensation for more PTO. And that's totally okay with them. And it's okay with me as long as they're okay with it. And that they're aware of the impacts over time. We see with income specifically, you know, if you take less salary earlier in your career, you will be further behind than your peers for basically the duration of your career. That is how the gender wage gap continues to persist. So even though it is closing, which is nice, arguing for higher salaries and doing so consciously is one way to address the gender wage gap up front, but also recognizing that your starting salary does typically dictate more or less your career salary trajectory. And the higher you start, typically the higher your trajectory goes. People tend not to leave employers for less money. Not always, but it is the case. So the idea is if that individual has ranked PTO is more important to them, uh, I should say paid time off just to define it for clarity. If PTO is more important to them because their spouse lives across the country and they want more time to go visit them, cool, that's fine. And, you know, that might just mean 5000 less dollars in their compensation or something like that. It's all about just making informed decisions. As long as you're informed, I don't really care if you make a decision I wouldn't agree with. You've been informed, you know the pros and cons, and you can move forward feeling confident that you made the best decision for yourself. Wise advice. <laughs> So what are the most overlooked benefits in veterinary contracts? I'd say I'll answer it the opposite. I think far too much emphasis is put on salary and signing bonus. I think what I have seen is group health care has taken a turn for the better recently. Employers are recognizing if they put in the upfront cost of starting a group health care plan, starting a group retirement plan, 401k, simple IRA, something like that. Those are benefits that, to use a sales term, make associates sticky, meaning they're more likely to stick with you because those benefits have so much residual value beyond just the upfront, hey, you know, it's saving me $200 a month in health insurance premiums. It's recognizing that you can build relationships with the doctors in that healthcare network and feel reasonably that you'll be able to reliably see them for the near future, right? Same thing with simple IRAs. I, I feel simple IRAs, 401ks, that basically is the employer investing in their employees without necessarily needing to. And like I said, you treat your employees right, they will recognize it and they'll stick with you. So it's an investment in the company to do these things. And oh, by the way, you get to write off a lot of those costs as a business too. So it's a win-win, right? You get to keep your associates and you get a little bit less of a tax burden. So those things I'm finally seeing, whether it be, again, because there's more corporate players in the game, but also with the private employers, the small businesses, they are finally recognizing like, hey, it is cost effective to do this. It not only is the right thing for our associates, but it helps them stay around a little bit longer. Can you go over a simple IRAs? Because I know it's really simple to set up. It's called a simple IRA. Huh? Uh, <laughs> but otherwise, a lot of people don't know about it. And it's just a matter of either the employer looking into it or the employee asking the employer, hey, can we set up a simple IRA for myself? Yeah, absolutely. So a simple IRA is an employer-sponsored retirement account that is designed for small businesses. With a normal 401k or 403b, typically there's a lot of cost involved with setting one of those up. You have to meet with a custodian like a Fidelity or a Vanguard or a Schwab who's going to pitch you on these are the different products that we can offer. You get to choose the menu of options, la di da di da With a simple IRA, it's more along the lines of, hey, I'm a small business. Here's the plan documents that prove I'm a small business. Here's my roster of employees, taking it to one of those custodians, Vanguard, Fidelity, etc., and saying, hey, I want to set up a simple IRA. Now, the biggest differences are contribution limits, significantly lower with simple IRAs. I think I want to say 13,000, 13,500 versus 20,500 in a 401k per year. So the contribution limits are a little bit lower, but you're still offering a benefit over and above what they could get in a regular IRA, which is only $6,000 a year. It's automatic, so it can be deducted from their paychecks, and the employer puts it in. It operates in terms of what investment options are available. It's treated much more closely to a regular IRA, meaning you have thousands of investment options versus a menu of 20 to 40 options in a 401k. That's kind of a worst case. 401ks are getting significantly more flexible in terms of investment options in the last handful of years, too. So those are the big differences. Again, it's so much easier for a small business to open up. They have to prove that they're an employer. They have to prove that they have employees. They take those documents. 
you know, the formal LLC, incorporation, whatever articles that they are asked to based on their company type, provide that to the custodian. The custodian opens up an account and basically each employee gets to open up their own little account and the employer gets to dump some money in with a 3% match. And the employee can put in, again, up to 13000 again, 13500 I forget the specific limit for this year. But it's a really good option. It's flexible. It can roll over into another 401k or an IRA after they leave that employer. Or they can keep it there until the employer closes the simple IRA account. So lots of options. Super flexible. That 3% match is also compensation right? From the employer to the employee. So when we go to identify and try to quantify the benefits, we're also looking at what is that simple IRA match, if it exists. And then we have to look also, if it's a 401k, we have to look at what the vesting schedule is. How soon can that employee leave and take that match with them? That's what the vesting is, basically. Yeah. And from the employer side, you know, they are doing a 3% match, which is deductible for them. And for the employee, whatever they're putting in decreases your adjusted gross income, which is usually what's used to calculate your student loan payments. So you're decreasing your income in quotes, and maybe even paying less on student loans. Yeah, absolutely. On an income driven repayment plan, it's a two birds, one stone solution. And then we typically pull up a compound interest calculator and I illustrate to them, hey, look, not only does it save you this much in student loan payments over the life of your loans, whether that be 10 years or 20 or 25, but it also means that by the end of your student loan payment, you also have half a million dollars saved for retirement. Like, how does that feel? And it's like, oh, cow, wow, that's awesome, right? Those are kind of the hidden numbers that, again, when we look at financial wellness, we're trying to incorporate all of that stuff into the equation. And so that's kind of like an extra kicker is like, look, this also by doing this and paying less monthly in an income driven repayment plan, it allows you to do X, Y, Z saving for retirement and you have half a million or three quarters of a million dollars saved by 20 years. Yeah. As long as you're putting that money aside. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. <laughs> So what's the most unique benefit you've ever seen in a contract? Unfortunately, most contracts look very similar, which is good from a standardization perspective, but it also means there's like very little room for creativity. Obviously, you know, there's employer paid cars that are helpful, especially for large animal vets or equine vets that are moving around a bunch, being able to offset not just the cost of the vehicle, but the wear and tear on the vehicle, right? If that's a corporate vehicle, you don't have to pay maintenance on that instead of, you know, your personal vehicle. Something that's unique in the veterinary world from coming outside of the veterinary world is CE, but specifically like CE for like travel to vacation destinations, right? Like we're going to give you $2,000 a year to go to whatever Caribbean island and do a two day seminar and stay for six days kind of thing, right? Like that's nice. And so that's pretty unique. I haven't seen that in another industry. And it's also fun to be able to network, right? But also get away and and maybe your family comes with you and turn it into a family vacation. But yeah, I mean, again, most contracts that I've seen are pretty straightforward. They all kind of do the same things, cover the same things, or, you know, it's pretty consistently like they don't offer group health care, for example. Job contracts aren't sexy. They're not very fun, but they're important. They're important. (laughs) So, So read your contracts, please. Um, (laughs) uh, What are some pitfalls to watch out for veterinary contracts? Great question. So I see a lot of folks that focus very much on the one or the two year term. You know, this is a one year contract. And I need people to understand that in an at will employment state, it doesn't matter if you have a one year contract or a two year contract, they can fire you whenever and you can quit whenever. All that that one year contract is structurally providing is, hey, one year from now, we're going to review you and your performance and reevaluate your compensation, which honestly should be happening anyway, right? It doesn't matter that it's a one-year or two-year contract, again, in an at-will employment state. So that's a pitfall is people get really focused on that one year or two year or whatever. In in reality, it's just making sure that, that you understand what's expected of you and that your employer understands what's expected of them when it comes to leading and managing you and bringing you along and developing you as an associate veterinarian into a leader in the practice. And that kind of brings me to the other piece, which so many veterinary students focus on this concept, this really abstract concept of mentorship. And 
We have to focus in our team, career services, myself, practice management, who's also a DVM MBA. We focus on trying to have the student define what mentorship means to them. Just mm-hmm. because an employer says, oh, we offer this great mentorship program for six months, doesn't mean that that mentorship is actually going to do what you need it to do for you. Maybe that mentorship is that lead veterinarian meets with you once a week and reviews your cases. Cool. That might be what you need, but it might not be. Maybe you need someone that you can shadow for two months before you go out on your own. Maybe you need a formal um, sort of continuing education program for six months to help bone up on some of that knowledge from your first or second year that you might not be as strong in anymore. So I would say I've seen in contracts some element of we have a mentorship program. It's like, great, but what does that mean? And does it even matter? And that's where I'd ask people to be thinking critically about when it comes to choosing that job offer. How much are we weighing those more intangible benefits, things that you can't quite put a number on to quantify? Often I've seen new DVMs leave in, honestly, in like the first six months because they were promised some sort of mentorship program and they actually took ten, twenty thousand dollars $20,000 less in compensation because of this promise of a mentorship program or this culture that was just fantastic. And it ends up not manifesting at all. And now they're really disenchanted by the opportunity because they know they're getting paid less than market value and they're not getting what they were promised that you can't really quantify to begin with. So I caution people from putting too much emphasis on those more intangible benefits. Like, oh, you know, it just seems like that's a head vet that I want to model myself after. Great. But does that mean you need to work there or can they be a mentor from afar? And that's where, again, the networking comes into play is building those relationships without necessarily being your employer. Yeah, there are definitely a lot of nuances there. And whenever I get an opportunity to work with an extern, like a fourth year student, I'll talk to them about that there's a difference between having support and having the support you need. Right. You know, and it's sometimes hard to even define it. Yeah. And that's a great point, Meredith, because how many vet students enter the workforce without ever really having worked? And that's where I sit there and I talk to our first years and our second years who maybe they can't find a summer job or a part-time job during the semesters in a veterinary setting. And I say, cool, that's fine. Guess what? You can still get relatable, translatable skills working as a cashier at Publix or wherever, right? Mm -hmm. You're working through conflict resolution issues. You're working through how to work well in a team. You're understanding what type of leader you like leading you. You know, like there's still experience that you can glean from those types of opportunities. Yeah, it's not going to count as like a clinical setting type of experience, but so much of being a veterinarian is actually about conflict resolution and having difficult conversations and just generally good communication skills. You don't need to be working in a practice to get those skills. And if you can also learn about W-2s and taxes and all these other things because you're you're out in the workforce, even part-time, all you're doing is lowering the learning curve for when you are out in the real world as a practicing veterinarian, it's just less for you to have to learn from scratch. I might bring you up in another episode to talk about the difference between W-2 and 1099 work. It's always a question we commonly see. (laughs) It's tough. Taxes are tough. They're really tough. Our system is far too complex and some people are able to take advantage of it, but far too many of us are just lost. Yeah. So I'm going to steer us in a a bit of a different direction here. Andrew, tell us about your consulting business. What type of work have you been doing with that? And what types of groups are you working with through that? Yeah, so consulting business is Tide and Tempest financial planning. I'm in the Navy, Navy Reserve, so it's more of a nautical theme. The idea being tides, tides are predictable, tempests are unexpected, and financial planning needs to account for both of those things, unexpected as well as planned things that occur. So that's the kind of the premise of the name. It came about because in my role at NC State, I have been exposed to the veterinary community in a way that most financial professionals have not. And as a result, have insight into the community that few financial professionals have. And I was being asked to provide some of those insights and analysis of that context in formal settings, whether that be North Carolina Veterinary Conference or other vet schools or veterinary employers from around the country. And so basically all I did was try to formalize that into an entity that I can brand around. I've done presentations for different, like I said, different veterinary schools, 
Even different colleges and groups within the NC State community have asked me to speak. And it's really just a way to appropriately educate people with no strings attached. I don't sell product. I'm licensed to do certain things, but I'm not contracted to do them. Therefore, I can't sell any product, which means what you're hearing is my God's honest opinion based on my experiences and my analysis of anecdotal evidence. So it's a way for me to be able to have an impact beyond just the 600 or so DVM and house officers that I work directly with at NC State. Not to mention there's a lot of students who they want to work with somebody that they trust and they feel confident has their best interest at heart. And they want to work with somebody after the one year at NC State expires. And so this is an opportunity for them to do that. It's an advice only practice, which means, like I said, I don't sell any product. And it's a very affordable cost to those folks that want to work one-on-one with me in like a subscription type of format. So I speak at events, provide presentations, uh, educational seminars, but then also for folks that are interested in developing an ongoing relationship that exists as well in a way that is designed for young professionals to be able to afford and grow. I hope that answers your question. Yes. Yes. That, That sounds pretty cool. Thank you. Absolutely. So what is the best way for our colleagues to connect with you then? So if it's NC State related, then feel free to to contact me at A-R-O-T-Z at N-C-S-U dot E-D-U. If it's more, hey, I want you to come speak or, you know, I've got a group of people that I think would be interested in developing relationships with you, that's fine too. My email for the company is andrewrotz at tidetempestfinancial.com. There's a website that is probably going to be released tonight. I was just on vacation, so we didn't want to open up the website and then have it crash and I'm on vacation and all that stuff. So so that'll be an opportunity for folks to understand more about me and what I do and why I do it and how to get in touch with me. Feel free, obviously, to get me on LinkedIn as well. Last name is R-O-T-Z. Awesome. Thank you. We'll put that in the show notes. Absolutely. And so, Andrew, that brings us to our last question. What is your best advice for our listeners? Put simply, be curious. Make thoughtful decisions based on that curiosity, right? Do research, but don't feel like you know everything because no one does. And so that's where being curious is helpful. Even if you're a subject matter expert, it's actually interesting to provide some context as to why I say this. So when my first child was born about four years ago, had some medical issues prior to his mother was in the hospital for a while. It was shocking. It was like a a crash course in how much art there still is in medicine and how it's not hard and fast science all the time because we just couldn't get definitive answers on things that were happening. So it illustrated to me that we did some research and we actually found that mortality rates amongst doctors were lower the more recently they graduated from medical school because they're more up to date on current techniques and procedures and technology And so it really kind of informed me as like, just because someone's been doing something for 30 years doesn't mean that they're the best at it. In fact, it probably means that they feel firmly entrenched in the way that they've done things and that the way they are doing things is the best way, despite not really being curious about, are there other ways to do things? So in all communities, in all professions, be curious. What don't you know that you don't know that you don't know? That is the best way to make yourself the best person and professional possible. And so that's why I say, be curious. All right. That's excellent advice. Thanks, Andrew. Thanks for your insight today about contracts and job offers and just life. And thanks for sharing your expertise with us. Thank you so much for having me. I I really enjoyed being able to share with you all. And I look forward to, you know, continuing to listen to your, your episodes as they come out in the near future. Thank you, Andrew. Yeah, this is a great episode. We get a lot of questions about contracts. Certainly one I'm going to forward to anybody that asks questions. Good stuff. Yeah, We're happy absolutely. to help. Good stuff. Thanks, Andrew. If you like this episode, click the follow or subscribe button. Until next time, take care and continue your path to financial success. The information provided in this podcast is for informational purposes only. It should not be considered legal or financial advice. Consult with a legal or financial professional before making any investment decisions.